Hello and welcome to Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. On today's program, we'll be hearing from Dr. Kevin E. Stafford from his Wednesday night Bible study with practical teachings from God's Word along with questions and answers. If you're interested in a copy of this program once in the past or would just like to know more about fellowship, stay tuned and we'll have that information at the end of today's program. And now, here's Dr. Kevin E. Stafford with today's Bible study. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples were told, meet uh, for the promise and you're going to receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Here's what he said, Rev. He says, you're going to be witnesses of me starting in Jerusalem. This represents Jerusalem, home. Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. In other words, our ministry should go beyond the four walls and, and infiltrate um, our region, our nation, and our world. We have at our disposal a vehicle to take our ministry beyond fellowship, beyond Fresno, beyond California, to the whole wide world each week. And so I'm excited about the fact that God is blessing us um, with the opportunity to be a blessing to the world. I listened and it's, it's so crystal clear and such qualitative, um, such a qualitative broadcast. Uh, it's done with such professionalism uh, and I'm excited. I, I re-listened and I heard some of y'all asking some great questions and we were able to dialogue. Um, and um, I want to have each of you be responsible for sharing what God is doing in our ministry. And it makes it easier when you can just tell them, go to YouTube, go to YouTube, and pull up your church. Now make sure you put Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church Fresno, because there's a whole lot of Fellowship Missionary Baptist churches around this country. Uh, and we are distinguished as that which uh, God gathered together here in Fresno. That's just a, that's just a commercial. I gave you a commercial break. Um, now let's get back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Um, I've been trying, um, uh, to, to not, not rush you, but not bore you. Tony, I've been trying to, uh, do my due diligence, uh, to cover, um, the material in a, in a way that you don't feel like you're, you're choked and trying to tiptoe through it. Uh, but because some of it is so basic, I, I understand that it could be uh, challenging to keep your attention. And I want y'all to be honest with me. Uh, am, am, I, am I being too redundant, too repetitive? I got one person to say, yes, God bless your honesty. <laughs> Anyone else, am I, am, I, am I going too slow? Am I, am I being too, uh, too repetitious? Okay, y'all, you okay? So you're okay with the pace. What are we talking about? What have we been talking about? What's been the topic of conversation? Romans, salvation, sin, gifts, sanctification, everything. <laughs> Most everything that is pursuant to our Christianity. Uh, I started with uh, the overview. Um, kind of tried to give you what you have in your possession, um, an outline of what the book of Romans looked like. That's the first handout. Um, we tried to go over that exhaustively, and I think we, we pretty much concluded that one. And we graduated to uh, the second lesson, lesson two. Uh, and I think we dealt with pretty much all four stages of what Paul calls the devolution of, of humankind. Um, we, we have devolved. 
to the point where Paul argues that in chapter one, he's introducing himself um, as, as one who we can find credible. Credible because um, he knows what he's talking about. Credi credible because he was chief amongst hell raisers. <laughs> he was a show enough sinner. Uh, and and uh, his testimony um, grips us because um, post-salvation, he became as vehement a saint as he was a sinner. In other words, he didn't miss a beat. He, he was tenacious and tyrannical as a sinner, trying to kill folk, uh, literally uh, getting legal papers to go and find him some Christians. <laughs> but then post Conversion, we find him being so tenacious as a saint that even when they threatened his life, he didn't back down. Even when he was thrown into prison, we find him not lamenting. We find him uh, laboring to squeeze out a letter uh, to encourage somebody else. <laughs> he, writes, he writes some good stuff by way of encouraging uh, other saints from behind a Roman jail. He was, he was jailed and he was still saying, I, listen, uh, I know how to be a base. I know how I bound. I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in to be content. Matter of fact, let me help y'all. I can do all things <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. All this from behind prison walls. So, so this is a fellow who obviously understands um, what it means uh, to, to feel the tug of Satan trying to mess with you because you're now no longer on his team. All of us, uh, let me help you. The tug of Satan is real. He's angry with you. Savannah, because you have the nerve to be showing up at church, calling yourself a saint on a Wednesday night. The devil is angry with you, and don't you, don't you misunderstand. His intentions are very clear. To kill, to steal, and destroy. So in, in chapter one, he, he introduces himself and we find his credibility unquestionable. In chapter two, watch this. Chapter two, he's on a mission to convince the Gentiles that uh, they are sinners. The Gentile world sinners. Gentiles are sinners. Anybody who's not a Jew, he says, you're, you're a Gentile, you're a sinner. Guess what, y'all? That's you and I. You and I are born sinners. Why, Davida? Because we are born in sin, shapen in iniquity. And even on your best day, you're still raggedy. <laughs> you may not like me saying that, but it's scripture. I'm not making it up. All of your good deeds are, are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. You, you ain't righteous. You are not righteous in and of yourself. The only righteousness that you and I have has been imputed upon us by our elder brother. If God just looked at you, he would see sinful man that you are. Why? Because you and I are encased in some material that always cries out for satisfaction. Your flesh desires um, satisfying. And now that you're saved, your spirit is telling you no. And so every day, you're caught twixt in between. What the flesh is desiring, what the spirit is desiring. And Paul says, Gentiles, you're unsaved, you're, you're, you're sinners. By chapter three, he has to um, check the Jews. 
because the Jews were feeling good about themselves. Yeah, we are God's elect. We're God's people. We know the word. We study the word. Um, <laughs> um, and so Paul has to interrupt their, their flow of thought in the third chapter and, and, and say, listen, you don't escape. Jews, a matter of fact, you kind of hypocritical. You study the word and know the word. And yet you fail at doing the word. The Gentile, listen, they ain't got no choice. They didn't know, but you're born to study this word. And yet you fall short. In fact, you are as condemned as are um, the Gentiles. So his argument is that, get this, the Gentiles are messed up. The Jews are messed up. And he's building to say that, you know what? Everybody messed up. <laughs> not, not, not one of us are without sin. And the question becomes, what are we to do with this condition? And Paul's, Paul's letter to the church at Rome is simply to help them uh, to embrace the fact that they've fallen short. To embrace the fact that that they are sinners um, and he has to convince them well, the problem is um, your mind if you're not careful will play tricks on you and uh, you you can be in a state of sinfulness so long that you devolve to a place where you um, you, it just becomes commonplace, and, and you, you start to justify your sinfulness as if it's okay. Now watch this. Sounds kind of like us today. That if it weren't for the Holy Ghost reminding us that, that, that we fall short, some of us will, would walk around, I know it don't happen here, but walk around like we all that. Walk around uh, with an air about us as though we, we, we are um, approved of God in and of ourselves. God says, let me, let, let me, let me interrupt your little thought <laughs> and let me remind you um, that you're on your way to hell unless something happens between your birth and your death. Something has to happen drastic. Otherwise, because of your sinful nature, you'll die, you'll go to hell. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now, I'm trying to build this case because what I really want to do trying to give you the first two handouts because I really want to do this. I really want to graduate to the third handout. I'm going to do the best I can to get to that third handout, uh, but I want to, um, lest, you all, um, lest you all not get Paul's argument, I want to end this second handout by having you go in your Bibles, and I hope every soldier has your Bible. Go with me to Paul's letter to the church at Rome, Go to the third chapter, book of Romans. And I want to show you something. Romans chapter three. When you get there, let me know you're there. All right. I want to read in your hearing um, verse nine down through and inclusive of verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 9, it reads this way. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Did y'all hear that? None righteous, no, not one. Jews, 
and Gentiles. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now, ye, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 20, therefore, by deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Thus ends the reading of the word of God. I read in your hearing Romans 3, 9 through 20. What are you saying, Paul? Everybody messed up. And, and there is no, I see, and, and there is no escape. You, you can't be good enough. You cannot do anything right in and of yourself. You, you a hot mess. If left up to yourself, you are your own worst enemy. Yes, Savannah. Her question was, even though God is a loving God, he's also a strict God. How many of y'all agree, agree with that? That he's loving, but he's also strict. He's just. He's merciful, but, but, but he's just. He, he, he has um, a duality of nature also. Um, he's, he's, he's kind, but, but on the flip side, he'll chastise you. Come on, y'all. Yes. The wrath of, you know what? The, I would rather be in the hands of an angry man than an angry God. <laughs> so yes, Savannah, he's, he's, he's loving, but he's just. Which, which brings me to, back to the original question, how, how do you see God? And, and what, what are your thoughts about God? How do you relate to God? Um, because um, what has to happen of necessity is everybody has to embrace God as so real and tangible uh, that you want to form relationship with. He's not just this distant, mystical, uh, cosmic Santa Claus. He's real. Um, sister, sister Adeline, there's one songwriter that says, yes, God is real. For, for, he, for, for I can feel him deep in my soul. His love for me, just like pure gold. Yes, God is real. Um, but if the truth be told, how many of us in here tonight relate to God on that level. Think about that. When you talk to God, what does is, what is your conversation look like? Do, do, you, do you even embrace him um, as someone that you can talk to? <laughs> Rev said he's a jealous God. In relationship, he's very jealous. He, 
So jealous, Rev. I think he said, my name is jealous. You said, we're jealous? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Yes. Hold on, Justice. We are we taping this? Okay. Well, yeah, we didn't get want to get these questions. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, yeah. No, I've always just wondered about that because, um, like, there's always like those statements that are made like through social media and things like that, where they talk about how like you know, God is kind, but then he's he's wrath. He has that wrath, and then like it's like. For me, my justification, of course, is, is that he's God. Like, you know what I mean? He doesn't have, he doesn't really need any say so to be what he wants to be. He could be a mean God if he wanted to. He's God. Um, but like, how do you talk to someone and let them know that God is a jealous God about us? Well, that, that has to be, um, it has to evolve in the context of relationship. You got to first Person, a fir first, a person has to embrace God through relationship and not religion. All right. you, 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 have to, you have to understand God as relational in order to even embrace him as a deity of jealousy. If you don't think of him in terms of relationship, you, know, it, you can't even fathom him having the emotion of jealousy. You, you follow me? And that, that's the reason why some people are callous in, in how they, they deal with God because they don't embrace God as a God whose feelings get hurt. And that's, it, think about that. What would his jealousy look like? Mm. Watch this. The, the easiest way, again, I always try to use the, the natural to express the spiritual. Anybody ever been in a relationship with somebody who's jealous? Where you been? <laughs> you said, <laughs> I called you. You wasn't even at church. You said you love me, and yet I can't get two and a half hours out of you on a Sunday. Really? Really? <laughs> oh, so, so the game was more important. Oh, okay. You mean to tell me, huh, you gonna treat my son like that? Jesus? Why don't you, why do you only call me when you need something? That's, that's, that's what it sounds like. Relationship, yes. Is it safe to not confuse jealousy with possessiveness? Watch this. God is a possessive God. I am the Lord your God. You are my people. I brought you out of Egypt. Matter of fact, save yourself. Can't do it, can you? But Kathy, what can wash away your sins? But the blood of Jesus. I own you, says God, twice. I created you, you messed up, then I saved you. So yes, he is possessive. He is. Yes, Tyler. But it's safe to say that he does all of this out of love, right? Because I just know a lot of people who struggle to have a relationship with God because he always they always feel like, oh, like if you do something bad, he's going to like... Strike you down? Yes. So like he does all of this out of love, right? Yes, he chastises those who he loves. Chastise means to correct or chasten uh, it's 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 less punitive it's it's more um, correction 
So yes, it's, it's the picture of, um, and I, I told, told your brother, my son this, um, he gets upset sometimes, D, because the coach is always yelling at him. He always yelling at me, he hates me. I'm like, son, let me help you something. Come here, let me holler at you. When he stopped yelling at you, that's when you need to worry. That's when he's like, you know what, I'm through, I'm, I'm good. Just to add to the love that God has for us, <clears throat> also I would say because of his wisdom for us, also um, he knows that if we go to something else for our needs, it's not going to treat, that thing is not going to treat us like he would. That we won't get the things that we need, the healing that we need from something else. Um, so a lot of his wisdom, he knows what the outcome is going to be when we start putting things in front of him. Um, when we try other things, we hear, well, this person is, has, they have a PhD, they have this and they have that, but they're still human. They have flesh. Mm -hmm. And they, they make mistakes. So he's the only God that I know that does not make mistakes. Never so known him to make one. No. Um, and is consistently giving us another chance. That's, that's what real love looks like. Real love is so forgiving that it, it is unconditional. I see you, Deke. Um, there are essentially three major kinds of love that scripture talks about in the original language. There's eros, there's philos, Agape. Eros is that love that say, ooh, you look so good. I love you. <laughs> Problem with that love, you know, if you, if you, if you married him because he had six pack, baby. <laughs> Where is the love? <laughs> That's funny. Thank God, it's deeper than arrows. <laughs> Philos. There's a city named after that love, Philadelphia. That's brotherly love. And that's a deep love because scripture says, twin, greater love has no man than to lay down his life for a friend. That's deep love. But then there's another level of love that scripture talks about. I heard you, just us. Agape. Agape is unconditional love. In other words, I love you if you're tall, dark, and handsome. I love you if you're short, fat, and bald. I love you when you're right. I love you when you're wrong. I love you with a degree of unconditionality that it's not because of you that I love you, it's in spite of yourself. That is the level of love that God has for us. Watch this, because if it was on our own merit, um, the scripture would not tell us for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. So, so that's what love looks like. And, and, and if he did all that for you, you, you can't even say amen every now and then. <laughs> can't even say praise the Lord. I mean, people have to beg you to praise the one that died for you. That, that's that's kind of... You know, that, that's not what real love should look like. If I've got to go home and say, baby, uh, do you love me? You know, you ain't said it in a while. Say it. <laughs> I said, say it! If it, if it got to be like that, it's, it's, there's no reciprocity. Beat you had a question. Why would you say, why would you think that God's love sometimes hurts so bad? Ooh. <laughs> Why does God's love hurt so bad sometimes? Because uh, in love, sometimes he has to correct us. And, and, and get this, <laughs> in order for him to correct us, he ha often has to show us that we're wrong first. And most people don't like to see that. He has to show us the ugly in us. And most people don't like to see that. He has to break us to remake us. 
Um, in Jeremiah 18, I see you, Nora. In Jeremiah 18, uh, the scripture talks about uh, the potter's house and how um, the potter has dominion over the clay. Uh, and he puts the clay on the wheel and he molds the clay. And when he sees that it's marred in his hands, he breaks it and remakes it again. That's us. We are the clay, he is the potter, and we are critically marred because of our flesh. And so consistently and constantly does he has, have his hands on us, reshaping us and remaking us and, and breaking us. Anybody ever been broken? One, two, three of us. Okay, all right. <laughs> Maybe you don't know what brokenness looks like. It means your spirit is crushed. It means you're hurt so deep within that you don't even know which way to turn. That's broken. And many times, we blame the devil when the devil's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, me? It's God correcting some flaws in us. Yes? How do we tell the difference? Say that, ask that question again. How do we tell the difference between the devil and God? In terms of being broken, God breaks us to develop us. He breaks us to bless us. The devil does it to destroy us. I see you, Justice. Paul says, get this, and we know, yada in the original Greek, we know, we, we've learned through experience that all things work together for the good. So, so sometimes, immediately you don't know, but you learn through experience that that bad situation that you were blaming the devil for, it was God taking something out of us that we did not need because it would not be conducive for where he's trying to take us. Make sense? Sometimes you got to come through and be like, you know what, I've been blaming the devil. That was God all along. He had his hands on me and it was hurting, but I, I was, he was hurting me to heal me. Make sense? Yes, Nora, I'm sorry. Um, if, but back to the, the part where... Um, Bobby had said about it hurt, it hurt yes, so bad. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that hurt, that how you feel that hurt, is that confirmation or can that hurt be confirmation of you, your relation? You have somebody, you got to know somebody or have some feelings about somebody in order for somebody to hurt you. Yes. I think that when, when something like that happens, there's a relationship involved. So is that confirmation that, you know, you, you do have your, you know who, who the father is, you, that's, that's confirmation of your relationship with God is what I'm trying to say. Not always, because again, sometimes you have to come through something and then look at it in hindsight and retrospect and then see, you know what? That was God. And then that can become confirmation. Tony, I see your hand. Then that can become confirmation. But there are times in the midst of it, all you can do is believe that God is for me. <laughs> if God be for me. But Dick, I think somebody said, since God be for me. But in the middle of it, you, you, anybody ever been there scratching their head talking about, ooh, I don't know about this one, Lord. Ooh, ooh, I didn't, I didn't expect this one. Glendetta, where did this come from? This right here is some brand new stuff. Anybody? <laughs> You like, Kathy, you like, whoa. Oh, oh hold up. Hey. Hold on. <laughs> up the brakes on this one, God. But you also said it's not confirmation that it's a devil either. I mean, it's not bad. It's, the devil it's easy to blame him. Most of us want to blame him. I want to slap the devil all the time, and sometimes he's like, I ain't do nothing. Man, you think God would give us yeah. that type of time? Uh, <laughs> Brother Tony, then I'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Um, 
So what you're saying is, Uncle Bobby, I think the question he was, why does it hurt so long? I so mean, bad. So, so bad? Oh. Yes. Well, I, I believe that as a potter or a mechanic or, or anybody who runs a fine-tuned machine, if something is out of order, it causes the rest of the, the whole machine to mess up. But in order to get it back in, sometimes you have to beat it in. Sometimes, but you want to get it aligned. Once it's lined back up, the pain is over. So sometimes it hurts so long because we don't want to conform, too. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I see you, I see you, Sister Mitchell. Um, I'm going a, to I'm a, I'm a disclose something to y'all because y'all family now. If I hear it in the streets, I know where it came from. <laughs> um, my baby sister, um, she teases me to this day. We, you know, we, we have a relationship that that's my, one of my best friends. Uh, we, we go back and forth, Tyler, cracking on each other. You know that. Um, I had a basketball injury uh, back in college uh, wherein I'm playing defense. <laughs> and a uh, uh, fella dribbled the ball right in front of me, and I went to grab the ball from him, and somehow the ball got stuck between my finger and the floor. And, and it, did you just say, uh? <laughs> we family, you ain't supposed to. That's what my sister be saying, uh, put that thing away. <laughs> it's, it's, it broke, it, and it, it, it's facing, it's facing, what is that, south? <laughs> Everything else is facing due east, this, this is south. It, it goes this way. And it, 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 it Broke and it got stuck like that. It was stuck like that over here. And, you know, I'm tough. I'm like. <laughs> um, and I, I, I pulled it over as, as best I could. Uh, but the doctor said, the trainer said, you need to go to the doctor. The doctor's like, I need to re-break it and reset it. I'm like, no, you're not. Well, I don't know who you're talking to, oh, sir. That's not going to happen. Do you know how bad this hurt? You, you want to do it again? No, sir. No, sir. And this is the result. <laughs> don't need the old one. Oh, wow. My crazy sister, you got one too bad. My crazy sister, you know, when I'm preaching, sometimes I'm preaching, she's like, could you stop preaching with that hand? <laughs> I can't even see Jesus because I'm looking at your finger. That's <laughs> That's my sister, she's, you know. <laughs> so I'll be preaching with it in my pocket sometimes. You see me in my pocket, that's why I don't. <laughs> Made me all self-conscious because I got a finger. She's like, stop pointing at me. I'm not, I'm pointing over here. <laughs> um, I don't know how, I don't know why I said that. I, <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but no, it, it was in reference to you saying sometimes um, we've got to break something to remake it and the pain associated with it being broken is devastating but the end result is it, it's straight many times when God sees that you're out of joint he has to break you to put you back together again and, and there has to be a level of trust that, that he's breaking you, not just because he's being mean to you. He's breaking you for the ultimate purpose of perfecting you. And that has to be through relationship. That's why I've been intentionally probing um, the congregation um, as to how you view God. How, how do you see God? Who is God to you? Because if you don't See him as, as your father who loves you. If you don't embrace him as such, who wants to get close to somebody who you perceive as mean and, and, and all angry all the time? You, you want to be in love with somebody like that? I don't think so. So we have to embrace God as a God 
whose love is so encompassing that even when he has to chastise us or break us, it's in an effort to remake us ultimately for our good. That's the confidence that Paul has when he says in eight, Romans 8, 28, and we know right. that all things work together. Yes, yeah, Sister Mitchell. I, I was just thinking about an incident with my mother when I was younger. My friends used to go out to parties all the time, and I didn't. I stayed at home, and I helped her, got straight A's in school. So this one party I really wanted to go to, and I thought she should have let me go. So I asked her, and she said no, and went to the car to go to the store wherever she was going. And I said, oh, she makes me sick. And my little brother heard me. Uh -oh. And before I can catch him, he ran outside. And before I knew it, I heard the car door slam. Uh -oh. I heard the door open, and here she came to me. And she stood in front of me. And the look that she had on her face was me, all the things that I do for you. And I make you sick. And when she was looking at me, the feeling that I had, that hurtful feeling, how could I say that? You know, right away I'm thinking, how could I say that? I wanted her to hit me. Make to make, feel better. make yeah. me feel better. You know, to make me feel pain, feel the pain, rather than the feeling that I had inside. I wanted that pain to hit my flesh. How can I say that? She right. makes me sick, knowing that everything, all that she did for me. She knew what was best for me, you know, telling me, no, she didn't want me to go there. And the things that I heard that happened there, I'm glad I didn't. Right. I'm glad she said no. Sure. I didn't know, you know, she was protecting me. So <laughs> that's what I thought of, you know, when you said, when he hurts us, mm -hmm. it's not really to hurt us. He knows what's best for us. Exactly. We don't know he knows. Exactly. And when we do wrong like that, we should feel bad, you know, and I did. That's what made me think of. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. now, now watch this, and that's very, very uh, good commentary. In your flesh, you didn't like what your mother said. That's what most of us feel when God tells us what he tells us. Often his will doesn't match with ours. What he wants for us, often, most often, Sister Sonia comes into conflict with what we want for ourselves. Yes. So if you don't have a relationship if you don't have a relationship with God and you're still going through all these hardships, is he still working on you? If you're saved, whether you have a close relationship or not, you still have a relationship. See, once you've accepted Christ Jesus, he's, on, he's in there. Now, it's up to us to get to a place where we allow he who is resident in us to begin to shape us and lead us and guide us. That, that's, that's an individual relationship that each of us have to, has to come to. Pastor, let me, let me I, I, yes, I know sir. I didn't raise my hand. Oh no, that's okay, man, go ahead. But I need to testify real quick here because Savannah, I met her upstairs. Yes. And got to know her. She never, ever, not one time, asked a question upstairs. And I didn't heard her ask about five four, or six five. of them tonight, right? <laughs> it's, it's working. It's working. Praise it's the Lord. Working. It's Praise working. It's working. Yeah, I give God some glory. It's working. That's all it's right. Working. Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. This is good stuff. Yes, just us. I wanted to say, or like, so like for us being um, believers and having a relationship with God, I heard this from like a sermon once and basically saying like, if would you agree that um, anything that happens to you, uh, taking it as if it's from God instead of always trying to place it on the devil, even if it is him, but like thinking of it as God and since we have a relationship with him and if, you know, if your relationship's good, you ought to think highly of him and know that he doesn't mean anything 
harmful to happen to you, wouldn't it be like a good idea to think of everything that happens to you as coming from God so that you possibly take it with a better mindset, a better mind frame, knowing that God is working all things together for your good? Let me see if I can answer your question this way. God has charge of everything. Nothing happens by chance. It's either a part of his permissive will or his perfect will. In other words, either this is something he set in motion or this is something he allows to happen but is still under his awesome, omnipotent, power, sovereign. Greatest example, and here, let me give you the answer to your question, then I'm gonna give you an example. Yes, it's best not to just think of everything that's coming from God to know everything is ultimately in the hands of God. Even when the enemy does what he does, meaning it for evil, God means it for your good. Um, so, so let me answer the question, the question that way and then draw you to, to the uh, example of Job. Rev, Job, man, you ever just read the book of Job and, and just read some of the stuff, Deacon Stevens, that happened to that fella? First of all, it's crazy that the Bible opens up saying Job was an upright man. Faith, he was faithful. He was righteous. He, he didn't do nothing wrong. Well, now, help me. <laughs> you mean tell me if I'm, I'm good and I don't mess up, I'm still subject to Satan? Oh, yeah. That, that don't seem fair, does it, Deke? Don't? It doesn't? It does not seem fair. Because Looks like to me, if you're good, you should prosper. But if you're bad, you should suffer. If I was God, that's how I hook it up. If I was God, you mess up. I get you. I get you. If I was God, okay, you good. Bless you. Bless you. That's you. That's the way we think. And, and, and in, in Job's day, um, it's called the Deuteronomistic, 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 there it is, Deuteronomistic mindset. The mindset was if you're good, you prosper. If you're bad, you suffer. And so that mindset was prevalent with Job. That's why his friends were like, yeah, you. You be, you be fronting. You act like you're so holy, but God knows better. Behind closed doors, you're doing something. That's why you're suffering, Job. But before Job was allowed to suffer, Bible says uh, Satan came to a meeting where, where the, the, the children of God were there, and Satan shows up. Hey, where you, where you been, fella? I've just been going, I've been going to and fro, seeking whom I may devour. I'm looking for somebody to mess with. Just, just, just like the devil, boy. <laughs> Trying to find something to get into. So God says, Rev, have you considered my servant Job? God offered him up. God suggested his servant, have you considered my servant? Satan's like, yeah. I, I've wanted to get a hold of him a long time. <laughs> I've tried. You, 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 you got a hedge of protection around him. You've built a fence around him. I can't get to him. Tell you what. Let the fence down. I guarantee you I get him. 
God says, okay, just don't, don't mess with his, his life. Don't, don't kill him. Don't, his soul belongs to me. I guarantee you my son's going to be all right. The devil's like, I guarantee you he won't. God's like, okay, we'll see. And so here he goes. And in succession, things happen to Job. Loss after loss. Job, Job, Job. The house where your kids were partying at, it, it, it fell down and killed everybody. I'm the only one that got away. <laughs> Job, Job, all your cattle, it's been destroyed. I'm the only one that got away to tell you about it. <laughs> that dude that keep getting away. <laughs> He ends up uh, in an ash heap, dressed in sack sackcloth, which, um, according to tradition, were the clothes of mourning. Boils on his, on his body. It's the crazy part. His wife runs in there like, Whew. uh, Honey, <laughs> you, you know, you, you probably should, ooh, ah, ooh. You probably should go ahead and curse God and die. Now, now, Brother Tony, listen, it's one thing for her to say curse God, but then she's going to holler out and die? You got a policy on me or something? You just, you just what is this? And in all, he says, the Lord gave, the Lord take away. Uh, I'll wait till my change comes. I said all that to say this, just us in answer to your question. I know I took the, the high road, the, the long road, but it's, your question is profound because many of us uh, have had to struggle with tragic occurrences and embracing the fact that e even though it, it's, it's devastating, it, it's still divine at the same time. That's a bitter pill to swallow. Something so devastating can ultimately be divine of God. God allowed it to happen. But, and I, I preached a sermon once, um, I believe it's that the last chapter of the book of Job he says, I had heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Y'all think about that. I had heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now that all of these things have happened, now that I've suffered all of this loss, now that I, I've been devastated, now, mine eyes, I know you on a whole nother level now. I think that's the 54th chapter of Job. Look, um, find it. Yes. Yes and the yes. I, I, for myself, you know, it's, it's, it's been strange um, that, you, that, you bring, that you bring that scripture uh, into play because mm -hmm. along with that in Romans 8, 28, um, my wife and I have found ourselves at a completely different level of relationship with God now, with, uh, with, with Luz and Dominique, because of a loss, you know, and it's strange. You know, you hear these, and, and you guys need to understand, you hear these scriptures, you, you, you read them, you hear about them in Bible study and Sunday school and preaching and all of that and everything like that, you know, but until it actually takes a direct effect upon your life, you really won't know what it feels like. Um, Romans 8.28, you know, after you've had a devastating loss like that, and you turn around and go, all things work for the good, yeah. after a devastating loss like that, it's very strange. But then you turn around and you hear Job say, you know, I've heard you, but now I see you. That right there in itself brings your relationship 
whole lot closer. So I'll say this, take what you are learning and everything in scripture extremely serious. Build your relationship as close as you can with God because uh, uh, um, learn the lessons that you hear from others so that you don't have to go through them yourself. Hmm. Well said, sir. And that scripture, by the way, is Job 42 and 5. Job 42 and 5. Yes, Tyler. how out of all that mess, Job was still able to see God within all that mess. <laughs> My child just say, out of all that mess. <laughs> Anybody feel like I've been through so much mess? Yeah. How does he? See, and, and you'll hear me say this time and time again. I know you've heard it many times before. Y'all probably have heard me say it here before. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to stand and proclaim and preach what I heard. I'm, I'm passionate about my, my preaching assignment always. Every time I stand, I'm, I'm trying my best uh, to, to dig so deep within the riches of the hidden treasures of the word and, and pull up pearls of wisdom and, and try to preach it with passion. And, and I, 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 every time, I don't know how to not go hard, that's what I'm trying to say. And it's because I'm telling you what I know, not what I heard. What I've experienced. The, the passion behind it, Tyler, is because it is a living testimony for me and so I can say it unequivocally. I can say it, but not miss words. I, I can say it because I know it, because I've tried it, and, and it's been my experience. What, what happens in relationships, and this is both divine as well as natural relationships, they strengthen when you go through trials. Anybody in, hold on, anybody in here been married for a little while? In that little while, have you ever been through something that you're like, woo, boy, I didn't think we were going to make it through that one. <laughs> Woo-wee. <laughs> Lord have mercy, Jesus. Wasn't nobody but the Lord on that one. <laughs> Then you're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah man. And so you look back and you're like, wow. Uh, and it's an old adage, it's an old saying, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, that, that's an old saying, but the reality is uh, there's a lot of truth to that uh, because uh, within the context of a relationship, uh, when the, fi the fabric and the fiber of the relationship is tested, it, it literally fine -tune that, fine tunes that relationship. So, so, so when you go through something and, and God is right there from start to finish and, and you realize, you know what? If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have got through this. Amen. Then it strengthens your relationship. You know, I heard that you get people through some stuff. I had heard by the hearing of the ear. Mama told me, but it wasn't until I had to go through it for myself that now my eyes sick. I heard, some, I heard you a healer, but it wasn't until I got sick. Y'all talk back to me. There it is. No test, no testimony. Savannah, then Tony. Hold on. Hold your thought. We got to hear that. That's good stuff. Where'd your mind disappear too? <laughs> so instead of, um, when you go through all these hardships and these losses, instead of getting better, you become like an alcoholic or a drug addict and you never really get better. What, is that like a choice or? Choose ye this day who you will serve. Will it be God or will it be man? Yes, it's a choice. And, and what the devil loves to do is parade 
a choice that appeals to your flesh in front of you. That's what he does. He, 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 he puts stuff in front of you in, in times of struggle that looks good and looks like it will satisfy you. And, and you know, you, you eat it up and you're like, I feel good for a minute. But, but temporary satisfaction is all that it offers. You follow me? So, so yes, that, that's why Paul says, and I love, we can always anchor this back in scripture. That's why Paul says, as we're talking about Romans, that's why he says, every day I've got to make a decision. My flesh is crying out for one thing, but my, my spirit man is crying out for something else. I got to decide. I got to make a choice. The devil dances, parades those very things that really can lure me. See, your bait might not be my bait. Come on, y'all. Amen. But the devil knows just what to dangle in front of you, and he hits you at your lowest point. Are y'all with me? Amen. I'm going to go here and not come back to you. Uh, yes, sir. Um, what I was going to say is, is that the only tests that we fail are the ones that we give up on. And what I mean by that is God is with you at every point. But if you let that situation or that mess overtake you and then you decide to do your own will, you'll never come through the test. So, you know what I mean? So you continue to fail. But that's not God, because God's intention is for you to prosper, for you to succeed. So you have to trust him enough, which is what he was saying about relationship, that he's going to bring you through whatever it is. Yes. Scripture said, and I come to you, Rev. Scriptures, the scripture, and I can't, I can't recall it off the top of my head to recite it. Um, so take my word for it. Look it up when you go home. Um, the race is not given to the swift. but those that endure to the end. The word endureth literally means um, to have the wherewithal to hang in there. To, to, to even in the midst of the deepest desire to want to give up, decide I'm not going to give up. Endurance. To... to and um, my son runs track now. Uh, and I got tickled. He's like, Pops, I, I'm not doing none of them long events, huh? It's a sprint or nothing else. Eh? All the people running miles at a time. No, it takes some, some endurance when, when you're running and you on lap number three and a half. You're like, I got a whole nother half of track? <sighs> I give. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 9 and 11. Um, endurance, that's, that's, that's a fortitude, something that's deep within that drives you to hold on. I see you just us. let me come here, preacher, and then I'll come back to you, daughter. You know, it's one thing that we as Christians should do once we make a commitment uh, to live for God. You, you shouldn't have to make no more that decision all of the time because God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he tempt anybody with evil. But if you are tempted, you're led away on your own lust and entice. You know, but if your mind is made up, I don't wake up in the morning deciding whether I'm going to live for God. I made that decision a long time ago. It didn't bother me now when I wake up. I have no problem knowing who I'm, whose I am, and what I am, okay? I don't, it doesn't, doesn't question it. I have, I'm not, has, I, oh God. I wake up praising God for even the suffering that I have to go through. I wake up praising him. I, I feel sorry for God, <laughs> you know, because of what he faces every day of his life. How he see his people's living, yes. and how he see how old disobedient 
That's a level of maturity that I think all of us should aspire to. But I'm just going to be honest. I, I, even when I would do good, he was present. And even though my mind has been made up a long time ago that for God I'll live and for God I'll die, there are days of weakness. The spirit is always willing. Flesh is weak. And if I don't feed my spirit man on a regular basis, my natural flesh will take over. I got to have a balanced diet spiritually. And most believers, if the truth be told, do not have a spiritually balanced diet. That's why... There can be 198 people on Sunday and 78 on Wednesday. Right. Y'all missed it. Uh, I got you. <laughs> this is uh, food for the soul. Yes, this is where we can really digest the scriptures. We can rightly divide them. We can exegete. That is to extract meaning from scripture and chew on some nuggets of knowledge that can strengthen us. Because the devil, the moment you leave up out of here, is going to do something to tempt you. Yes, he is. He says, so you're going to sit up in Bible study two hours, huh? You know you would have had nothing to eat. <laughs> Some of y'all right here right now, like, when he going to hurry up? <laughs> I ain't had dinner. <laughs> right. It's been a long day, Rev. Hurry up. <laughs> uh, yes, Brother Hoover. I'm sorry, Brother Sister Jastus. Then, Brother Hoover. That's I was going to uh, backpedal to what Uncle Bobby was saying about um, just like knowing the word for yourself. Um, I don't know what scripture it is where it says like the word and please help me, but like where the word will go into like your marrow, into your bones, like it's supposed to be like if it cuts, was, cuts it uh, goes, Hebrews. It cuts um, oh, the word. The word is like two edged sword. It, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that part right there. <laughs> um, God, I was talking to Sonia about this recently, though, but like God had to really help me one day because I was having a real trouble understanding what meditation was because it's been, you know, there's been different ways of people showing off what meditation is sure. for a long time. And the best example that I was like given um, was like a cow in the curd is when a cow is chewing on his curd right. and how... It doesn't, it's not in a rush to get to the next bite and it's, uh, it takes a long time for it to even swallow it. And then when it does, it even brings it back up and chews on it some more. And that's right. how you should be about your word, how you read your Bible in the morning. You should read it at night or even bring it back to mind later on in the day. But that wasn't what I was going to say. I was going to ask if what you said about like the Holy Spirit and how we should always ask the Holy Spirit to help us put on our spiritual list lenses um, when we're reading the Bible, like to ask for help. Um, my question is, is God going to take us through the things in the Bible that we haven't had applied knowledge on? So like I'm reading my Bible. I haven't gone through everything mm -hmm. that, you know, mom and grandma and everybody has always talked about from sure. the Bible. Is God going to put me through those things so that I can have applied knowledge, wisdom about it? That That's too broad to answer for God, but I'll say it this way. Because you're predestined by God for a purpose, he knows what purpose that is. And if you need to go through a specific thing to perfect you for your purpose, then you will. But if that's not a part of your purpose, then, you know, he's not going to send you through that. You follow me? Uh, everything he does is on purpose with purpose. <laughs> He reveal it to you. Let's let's do this. We have, oh, sorry, brother. Really, really quick. I just wanted to add to. We were talking about choice uh, when you're struggling with something, uh, whether it be drugs or anything else. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about what the elders used to say: you have to track God for yourself. You know, you can't just go off my spirituality. You can't go off my experience. You have to track God. And so I think about that. That. I guess it's a question and a comment. Is there power in surrendering yeah. and saying, I know I can't do it on my own? 
rather than just saying, I need some help, but saying, I know I done tried it before. Until I surrender, I know I can't stop. So I need something stronger than me. Thank you, Brother Hoover. You really have parlayed us into where I was trying to get all night. <laughs> Paul establishes that all have sinned. Gentiles, you're sinners. Jews, you're sinners. Everybody come show the glory of God. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? What am I going to do? How am I going to find my way out? I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to live in hell and then go to hell. I need to be delivered from my condition. I need to be saved, sozo in the original Greek, to be rescued or delivered from. I, I need salvation. I, I recognize, get this, I realize that I'm messed up. That epiphany has to happen for everybody in here before you became saved. Everybody in here has to arrive, arrive at a place where you recognize, I'm messed up. I, and I'm powerless to help myself. And in that particular state of mind, you're then ready to reach for salvation. That's what Paul talks about in chapter 3. Salvation. So yes, there is power in professing, power in confession. I think I said uh, a week or two ago um, that we've got to assess it, address, confess it, assess it, and then address it. Assess it, confess it, and address it. I wrote the notes, didn't you? I can't remember. <laughs> Assess it, confess it, and then address it. Christ is our peace and pardon, our light and life, our leader and lawyer. He is our brother. Dr. Kevin E. Stafford and Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church welcome you to join us for worship each Sunday morning at 1045 a.m. They are located at 2529 East Belmont Avenue in Fresno, California. If you'd like a copy of this program, once in the past, or would just like a little bit more information about fellowship, you can contact them by phone at 559-441-1661. That's 559-441-1661. Or by email at fellowshipmbc at sbcglobal.net. One more time, that's fellowshipmbc at sbcglobal.net. Also, you can follow us on our YouTube channel at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church Fresno. Always remember, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of God endures forever. May God bless you richly, and thank you for listening.